All right, good friends. Welcome back. Tom Kiley here, INM World Report Radio. And as promised, our good friend Helen Beniski has joined us, uh, who's got the most excellent blog, Helen of Destroy.com, and um, who also writes for RT. Helen, welcome back to INM World Report. Hey there. How's, how's things going in your world? Uh, things are pretty crazy. The world is a uh, really, really disastrous place. But um, my, my world is good. But it's just, you know, looking, looking on as the uh, teeming swarms of people just doing all kinds of insane things. I mean, it's, I guess it's a good time to be a blogger or a journalist or whatever we're supposed to call ourselves these days. Uh-huh. Well, why don't we get right into it? I know it's high on your agenda and your mind and certainly many people. This whole um, dust up with Iran, it looks to me like it's just more of the, you know, same. I, I find it very, very difficult to rely on news reports about anything anymore, uh, Western journalism anyway. And it just got it has shades of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, shades of the fake uh, Ghouta chemical attacks and everything else. Uh, I, I, I believe maybe the Iranians shot down an American drone. I, yeah, they, they did. They uh, they they po- posted the video of it. They said right. uh, get get out of our skies, basically. And it's like the and Trump is saying, oh, this was a terrible mistake. Well, first first he said, oh, this is a mistake. They didn't mean to do it. And then then he said, oh, this is a terrible mistake. They're going to live to regret this. So he doesn't even know what his own message is. I mean, I, I obviously you have to take every report with a grain of salt. But I read somewhere that that he was interested in firing Bolton, and so in order to get he had to get permission to fire Bolton, though, from Sheldon Adelson. <laughs> and he went to Sheldon Adelson, and I, and I guess that that Adelson said no because Bolton's still there. But I find that difficult to believe. However, I can imagine that he uh, he is getting conflicting messages regarding what he's allowed to do as far as foreign policy because, I mean, we both saw him. We, we both uh, cheered him on as he tried to bring troops out of Syria, and then that never happened. So it's like there's obviously somebody else at the controls here. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I would really like to see this not escalate into a war because, uh, I mean, I've, I've been tweeting away at uh, at Trump on Twitter as far as that that will do any good. Of course not. But it is it is a little bit cathartic. And it's just, uh, you know, this is the last war the U.S. will ever fight. We're, we're not coming back from this one. I mean, no, it's not. We're not going to lose in the traditional sense of being wiped off the face of the earth. But we will uh, completely bankrupt ourselves. Uh, we will lose our um, what they're called aircraft carriers. Uh, there's no like there's no winning this war. The Pentagon war gamed it back in 2002. They tried to uh, they, and they, they had they cheated in a bunch of different ways and they still couldn't get it so that the U.S. won. So, I mean, this, this would be this would be the last war the U.S. ever fought. Well, um, right. And and to me, uh, several things come to mind. First of all. I don't see this as uh, legitimate. In other words, I don't see this as Iran doing stupid things um, to to start a war. I, no, I, 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 I rather doubt that uh, this thing was not over their territory. I, I, I'm sure it was over their territory. It was, very I'm much sure, so. I'm sure it is. It, and it, and it, I have no, no faith whatsoever in the American government or the uh, American news media. <laughs> When they claim otherwise, absolutely none. So in that sense, it's not a real, you know, war tension, at least from both sides. Now, having said that, we know the history of 9-11 and, uh, oh, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, remember the main, um, the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, uh, the fake chemical attacks in Ghouta, Syria, all this kind of stuff. We know that that's all just phony baloney stuff. And I think people are getting used to that. And uh, so that's the way I look at it. But even then, um, you know, when – first of all, to his credit, you know, Barack Obama didn't take the bait when they first tried that fake gas attack on him. And then Donald Trump, uh, you know, did some kind of baloney throwing some missiles around that didn't do anything. But he didn't take the bait either on, in the larger sense. And I think that pisses a lot of people off. Um, is he going to take the bait here? I think it's fascinating to hear him say that he can't believe this was deliberate. And he yeah. made a huge point out of that and um, signaling yeah, to everybody he's not he's not taking the bait, at least not right off the bat. 
Yeah, and it's the what I thought was really interesting, uh, not with this drone thing, but with the ships uh, the other week, I guess last week or the week before, um, the, the two, like like we're supposed to believe that uh, Iran would attack Japanese ships when the, the Japanese prime minister is sitting right there as, as a guest of their country for like a, a very rare visit too. the Japanese prime minister doesn't usually go and visit Iran. But OK, the guy's sitting there. We're going to like betray his hospitality by uh, blowing holes in his ship. Right, right. Uh, yeah, and but but what I thought was interesting was that the mainstream media didn't immediately bite on that one too. I, I was shocked to see that like CNN is saying, well, Iran has nothing to gain by doing this. So it's right. like it's a very much a boy who cried wolf situation as far as like they can't just completely make things up out of thin air anymore. They actually have to like make it a little more convincing. And then they put up that grainy video and everybody was like, oh, no, we still need a little more proof than that. So they put up a color video and people were like, no, we still need a little more proof than that. And it's just that they, they, they don't. So they had to. to so they've, they've had to just uh, string together all of these unrelated incidents. And then they then they said, oh, well, there was a drone. There was a drone that got shot down in Yemen uh, a month ago. And by by the Houthis, but we think Iran was involved because, uh, because just you know, because why not? And it was like, well, why did you wait? To, why did you wait a month to announce that one? It's a little weird. They've gone to that well, way too many times. And I think uh, while a, mo- a lot of Americans have had a bad taste in their mouth about all of this stuff, I think the, the straw that's been breaking the camel's back is the fake Russia collusion story that they were told for so long existed, and now. They they you know what you and I knew all along. It was it, it was fake news. It, it wasn't even really true. So I think they're just like beating a dead horse to death. And a B, I don't believe that the, the Pentagon and, and uh, you know, all of those people are, are all in unison with this, as you no, point out, as you point not. out, they know they know it's not a not a great idea to, to, to pick a fight with Iran. And uh, so I don't think it's a, a unanimous thing. So I think Trump has a lot of wiggle room, and he, I, I see him wiggling. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, Pompeo was going down to Tampa to try to uh, intimidate the, um, the the generals there to try to get them to oh to to get enthusiastic about the war. And it's like you, you know these guys actually have some sense of you know maybe not wanting to send their men into a meat grinder. And um, yeah, they're not they're not going to be so eager to jump on board. Because the thing the thing with all of these uh, all these bomb Iran people is that most of them, uh, at least, well, maybe not Pompeo. I think Pompeo was in the military. Although I might be wrong, but a lot of the a lot of the uh, neocons, the hardcore neocons, are all chicken hawks. They have had no military experience. They just like sending other people to die. So it's like, oh, no question, (laughs) no, no question about it. And it's, I think I think that it's, uh, you know, I I think that the the neocons, uh, uh, their star is finally sinking. Mm, I don't know about that. I mean, there's two of them sitting on either side of Trump. You got Pompeo and Bolton. It doesn't get much more neocon than that. I understand, but I think uh, you're supposed to keep your enemies even closer. Um, they don't seem to be able to send Donald Trump into war in Syria when they want, you know, and, and all the rest of it. So I don't know. I think Trump is uh, keeping himself alive by placating uh, people in a certain way. You know, I, I think he's dodged a lot of uh, bullets that well, we'll John, see, that we'll John Kennedy, happens. unfortunately, was not able to dodge. Yeah, I mean, well, it'll really depend on what happens, I guess, in the next few weeks in Iran. I mean, I'm not the only one who said this, but uh, some people think that oh, he's going to wait until uh, until an October surprise or September surprise or whatever. I, I joked that he's going to uh, bomb Iran on September 11th, but um, well, yeah, but he'd have to wait <laughs> until 2020 to do that. I don't think he's going to wait that long. I, I, I think it's because oh, the, yeah. the, the, election yeah, the election doesn't happen until there's no yeah. October surprise and yeah, surprise until 2020. True. So, true, but 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 I, but I think what he, it may be. A, a tactic, a negotiation tactic of his, and this is why I really, I don't really get too concerned about it because I think it's Trump's tactic to use bluster and talk big and everything else, and uh, you know then 
you know, try the, the, the honey after, uh, you know, after the vinegar. Yeah, but the problem with that in, in Iran is that it doesn't work because they've already broken the deal. They've already broken the nuclear deal. And so it's it's um, it's adding insult to injury at this point to expect that Iran is just going to be jerked around so easily. And I, th I think that, that, that the reason why they, they refuse to come to the negotiating table is because they feel personally insulted. And I can really I can see their side of the uh, of the issue, shall we say, because. I mean, a, they, they're basically economically strangling this country, which kept its side of the deal meticulously. I mean, they sent in all these inspectors and stuff, and Iran was completely measuring up to its side. Now, I'm, I'm no huge fan of... Hey, good friends. Welcome back. Tom Kiley here, INN World Report Radio. Helen Beniski with us tonight. We're just warming up. Uh, before the break, we were talking about uh, the uh, brinksmanship. Uh, I always get confused... Uh, I always thought, Helen, it was brinksmanship, but I hear some people saying brinkmanship. No, it's the, brinksmanship. With the yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so we've got brinksmanship going on, uh, literally with ships um, <laughs> in the, uh, was it the Gulf of Oman or something like that? And you, you, I, I, I can tell you, I, why, am I, why am I totally not surprised at all about this? Is, is, I'm about looking at which, my, which part? I'm looking at my watch, you know, since uh, Trump uh, canceled the Obama-Iran deal, okay, and and has talked about, you know, we want to make sure they don't have nuclear weapons and, and, and then got sanctions going again and all of this stuff. I'm looking at my watch and I'm saying, hey, it's been months now and we don't have a false flag attack going on yet or we don't have, a you know, a, a, some kind of a ginned up military problem going on yet. And now finally it comes – now during the summer, um, so so let's just say these are provocations, just like by the neocons and their establishment, just like uh, just like uh, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or the chemical weapons attacks in Iraq or the or the fake Russia collusion. Let's just say it's all. Do you do you think Trump was in on all of this stuff? All right, guys, give me a pretext so I, we can go to war. Do you or do you think it's being done uh, without his cooperation and knowledge? No, I think as usual, it's uh, Bolton and Pompeo are on a rampage. Uh, they they know they don't uh, actually have to clear anything with the man upstairs. I mean, they've they've really uh, Pompeo especially just has let everything goes to goes to his head. Like he's he's down there in Florida ordering the military chiefs around. He has no business doing that. Yeah, Pompeo and, and Bolton are just kind of figureheads for a much deeper. Deep, more deeply rooted deep state apparatus. Um, I, if it were, if they weren't there, I think the same thing would be going on with. with oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure somebody else. Nameless, would be faceless, other ones. You know. Um, yeah. They're they're just out front to be able to try to put a public face on it and a public spin on it. That's their job, you know. But um, and and that actually begs another question. You know, why does Trump have uh, the mustache, as he called him? I think. Uh, you know, this guy Bolton. Why does he have Bolton, do you think? Because uh, he, Sheldon Adelson asked him to put the guy there. I mean, I, and, and obviously Sheldon Adelson is just a stand in for whoever many other billionaires, uh, bloodthirsty billionaires who uh, think that uh, it's MEGA, not MAGA. As in make Israel great again. Um, they, I mean, it, it's they, they they need somebody to enforce their whims, and they know that Trump is not naturally inclined towards murdering large numbers of people in Arab countries, and so somebody else has to do it. Well, Arab, not Persian countries. Um, it, so Trump is not naturally inclined in this way, and so they need somebody in on the inside to uh, sort of force his hand. But it's like uh, it's like I was saying before the break is that his his uh, his bluster is not necessarily I mean, yes, it might work for the internal uh, purposes, for media purposes, media genic, et cetera. But as far as external, I mean, the, the it only has so much use as far as foreign diplomacy goes. Oh, I think he could just keep with the bluster for years. Uh, it buys him time. I mean, you know, uh I think I think you can keep going at that for a really long time. I, I'm sure it's for you know, and then and then how you know I I think that you know okay. So Trump has his uh, bosses that call the shots and everything. Yet he still hasn't gone to war in Syria. He hasn't uh, you know he's thwarting them. He's frustrating them. He's recognizing the Golan Heights. <laughs> you know he moves the embassy to uh, Jerusalem. You know so it, and now you've got a lot of Jews who are. Ejecting the Democratic Party as well. Um, 
I, I think mean, it's I, don't, a, I don't know about that. I mean, they they tried to make a, they they tried to say that that that, that was happening, but uh, I don't think that that actually happened. I think that was that that was like the um like the unveiling of Trump's uh, Golan Heights settlement, which was basically just a sign, and then it came out afterwards that well, actually, uh, no money has been allotted for a settlement at that location, and uh, no no uh, administrative action has been taken to actually have a settlement at that location. It was all just a a, a big uh, Potemkin like literally a Potemkin village with a sign and no anything to back it up. Uh, the the whole uh, thing of Jews exiting the Democratic Party, I don't think that's actually going on. They, what, where are they gonna, what are they going to do, jump on board the Republican Party? I don't think so. No. Well, there, first I mean, of all, they, there's a lot of Jews who are in the Republican Party to begin with. Yeah, but, uh, the, but they, they were already there. The neocons who were already there. But I, 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 think, that, um, I think that there is a serious movement where, uh, you know, a lot of Jews who, you know, thought all of this crazy social engineering was good are, are re- feeling now it's gone way too far with the the criticism of Israel. And, and uh, now you got this latest utterance from Ocasio-Cortez, you know, about the Holocaust, you know, tr- just tramping on sacred gar- ground, you know, and comparing these oh, border yeah. border things with the Holocaust. I mean, it. it I, I think that I don't know. Maybe Trump is like a lot smarter than anybody thinks because he seems to be playing all of this stuff right down the middle, if you ask me. And perhaps buying himself an insurance policy from the JFK treatment. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely not uh, treading on the the third rail, but it's by not treading on the third rail, I would argue that he's going uh, too far in the other direction. Like I, I've had people argue that, uh, okay, well, he's, he recognized the goal on heights, but you know, there's, that, that didn't actually do anything. And the next guy can just unrecognize it or whatever. No, the next guy can't just unrecognize it. I mean, you, you show me one American politician who has any chance of ever being president while doing something like unrecognizing some illegal territory annexed by Israel. Show me one, show me one. And I'll give you a thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to go in the future. I'm certainly not for it. Um, but, you know, things are changing rapidly. And, uh, you know, there's – there's, I don't know. I th- <laughs> the one-state solution would be very interesting. That's kind of unrecognizing an awful lot, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it, it's it, it, the the international community can condemn the thing, but if the U.S. is the U.S. has been using its veto on Israel's behalf for how many decades now? So, like, I mean, this is this is more of more of the same as far as that goes. It's just like it's it's something that that can't really be like reversed so easily. So, how long does that go on for? I mean, no, nothing, <laughs> last, nothing lasts. For, nothing lasts forever. I mean, you know. Um, That's a good question. I mean, it, it, everybody is against this except the United States. And as soon as the United States removes its support, uh, Israel is, uh, as they say, up the creek without a paddle. So I'm not really. I, I don't know what, but I, I don't. I just don't see that happening anytime soon because the U.S. is so firmly entrenched in just like ten million dollars a day taxpayer dollars goes to support this country. But I, there's no. No logic behind it. I I'm, I can well, only there, work. There you go again, though. You said the America does this, the U.S. does that. No, I don't think so. I think that uh, most Americans are not crazy about that at all. And, no, they're not. And there's but. more more jumping ship every day. So it's not America is this and that. The other thing, it's it's the the globalist oligarchs that like to try to get everybody to believe that America likes this or likes that or does this or does that. I'm not saying likes. I'm saying American money, American taxpayer dollars, 10 million taxpayer dollars every day go to Israel. That That's something the American government, the Congress voted for. Every, I mean, it's the one thing you can count on bipartisan support for is any bill supporting Israel. Right, but that's, like, not, that's not based on the will of the American no, people. It's, it's based on not. APAC money, right? Yeah, no disagreement there. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I don't know how long that goes on for. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. The money I, keeps flowing. I mean, if you talk to people like Gilad Otzman, uh, this stuff <laughs> happens over and over and over again. That It's cyclical, that it overreaches to the point where there's a snapback. OK, and uh, and that this has happened historically many times before. And he says it's, it's starting to happen now again. Yeah, I mean, it certainly can't happen fast enough. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't like to see 
I don't like to see bad things happen to uh, innocent victims, but unfortunately, the, the the people who are running Israel are using the entire Jewish community as a human shield, for lack of a better term. Well, I actually think the term is quite apt, but um, they're using the entire Jewish community as a human shield, and that's really unfortunate. I think the best thing that Jewish people can do is to uh, distance themselves from Israel, because I, I certainly wouldn't want to be there when that uh, blows up. That's, <laughs> it's not going to be pretty. Well, but this has happened in the past, people will say. I mean, you know, that um, it's it's oligarchy. Here's the thing, uh, Helen. Oligarchy is a feature of human nature, in my opinion. I think, you know, when they had the caves and everything, there were caveman oligarchs and cavewoman oligarchs, oligarchettes, okay? And uh, every country's always had them, and every culture has always had them. And yet, because... Uh, Israel hasn't been a country for thousands of years. We like to think that uh, the greater Jewish diaspora doesn't have them. But if, I think, of course, it has them as well. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Check one, two. Helen, uh, do we have Helen on the line oh, still? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, okay. You, you, went, you went down for a second. You said Israel hasn't been a country for thousands of years. That's right. Israel hasn't been a country for thousands of years, so uh, nobody is used to thinking in terms of Jewish oligarchy. Yet well, there it is. I mean, you know, it's been there all along, and and that oligarchy has sought to get its own country for a long time. I, I think that oligarchy sought to control countries like Russia uh, with with the Russian Revolution and, uh, and 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 deposing a lot of the monarchies in in. Um, in Europe, World War I being sort of the pinnacle of that sort of thing. But there's still a, a religious divide where you're not going to get a, a Jewish oligarch to run a Christian country. So the next – but you got to get your own country. I, I don't think that the Zionists are, have a bone in their body that's religious particularly, or at least the original ones. And I think they were funded by Jewish oligarchs who recognized that you know, they can they can tell a, a goy president to go invade this country or that country, and they'll do it most of the time, but they won't do it all the time necessarily. So it's better to have your own country. Then you get nukes. Then you can go do whatever you want. Yeah, it's funny. The um, oh, This stupid... Sorry, can you hear me now? The, the, my computer yeah, I, is... I, I is hear... so. All right, good friends. Welcome back. Tom Kylie, INN World Report Radio. Hour number two just getting underway with our good friend Helen Beniski. Helen of Destroy.com is where she writes her uh, writings. That's her blog. And also, Helen uh, writes for RT as well. How's it going over there, Helen? Uh, they it's, got you busy? It's good. Definitely busy. Definitely yeah. busy. Writing some good stuff. There's a lot going on out there. Uh, do you have an RSS feed or something? Can people ask I do. for? Okay. Yes, How do you get have... that? You can go on my website. There's um, that little RSS button. You can click that. You get the weekly. Well, you get every. You get everything I post, basically. Right. Okay, so you're building up a uh, following. Uh, you're getting some good feedback from people. Uh, yeah, hope hope so. I mean, uh, I, I can't really tell exactly how many people are like because you can't. You can only tell if somebody clicks on an individual article. But yeah, I'm getting definitely getting getting some good. Right. I mean, are you getting nice feedback from people? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. good. I think you got a great point of view, and that's why we have you on the show. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit. Um, the, you know, you and I, it's in our world. It's in, it's happening to friends of ours, activists, journalists, or bloggers, um, uh, alternative media people uh, are increasingly getting shut down, deplatformed, demonetized in, uh, on, uh, from all of these monolithic, uh, well, the the monolithic in their areas anyway, YouTube, the monolith as far as posting videos is concerned, Facebook, the monolith as far as social media is concerned, Twitter, the monolith as far as instant uh, messaging communications is concerned, Google, the monolith as far as, you know, God incarnate uh, for technology is concerned, um, and others. And, you know, we're familiar, we, we've, we've, we know people, we discuss how uh, alternative voices who are from generally true leftists, I would say, but not all, are, are, are being deplatformed. Now it's happening with increasing frequency on the right for conservative voices. And 
the conservatives are starting to really complain about it in, in the in the Congress. Even Republicans are complaining about it. Rush Limbaugh uh, is complaining about it, and uh, it it opens up a very interesting um, set of circumstances. I want to talk about the first part of it, and then I want to go into the second part, which you and I have discussed off offline. But the first part, if I may throw it out there, is the mindset of the, the thoroughly indoctrinated, uh, you know, mindset of these people, these young younger technologists, who, you know, suddenly have have amassed incredible wealth without the brains or the ethics uh, to match. And they put themselves in a position where they want to play God and, and control what is allowed to be talked about uh, on their platforms. And they start censoring all these people. Now they're, now it's reached the conservatives, not just the alternative people on the left and in the alternative media, but it's the conservatives too. And they're complaining about this. Um, what well, about the mindset first of, of these of these Zuckerbergs and whatnot, who who think that that that, they, that that's perfectly fine for them to do this. Well, it's always been uh, you know that that poem that everybody is talking about more and more. That first they came for the blank, and I didn't stand up because I wasn't a blank. And it's obviously the the news tightens ever more with uh, every every group that's knocked offline. And they figured, okay, well we've silenced the real troublemakers. Now we can go after the guys we just don't like. And then uh, after we've gone after them, we can go after uh, people are living in fear now that they're going to say the wrong thing and they're going to be deplatformed. And that's not how a free society is supposed to work, obviously, not like we've had a free society for decades. But like we've at least had sort of the illusion of one. And at least for a while, the Internet was relatively free as in you could uh, basically say whatever you want and assume. I mean, you've got that kid now who had his admissions revoked from Harvard for some private comment he made when he was 16, well, which admittedly was only two years before he was admitted to Harvard. But still, it's like we expunge people's criminal records when they're 18. Are we not going to uh, you know, give them at least amnesty for the juvenile comments they made on the internet when they were 16? And it's a little silly. But uh, getting back to what uh, what's going through these people's minds, it's very much, I mean, like I've always said that the Facebook thing is the revenge of the nerds. It's uh, these people are that they're still playing with my volume again. Um, the, these people are um, they they want to exert control over other people because they have nothing they have nothing that to themselves to uh, to really strive for. They have no meaning to their own lives except for the, the control they can exert over others. They want to make people miserable. Facebook has always been about Mark Zuckerberg being jealous of your social relationships and wanting to use them against you because he doesn't have any friends. Okay. Um, well, let's see. There's a lot to say there. Uh, I think that maybe there's there's some of that, but I also think that these we're we're looking at the fruits of years and years and years of social engineering indoctrination. You know, for sure. No, and children. And, and, you know, there's no competition. Everybody wins. It's all fair, and don't hurt anybody's feelings, and don't say anything that'll bully and hurt people's feelings, well, and all and this perhaps, stuff. And perhaps my my comment was perhaps too flippant because I really do think that this is part of getting you to censor yourself because the ideal police state is that you don't need the police anymore because you're policing yourself so well that nobody else has to do it. And so that's been uh, that's the rule now is that you are your own. You are the man within his burrows, put it. Um, you are policing yourself so well that we don't even need the police anymore. We can just uh, relax and know that nobody is going to step out of line because everybody just watches their own behavior that closely. And it's really scary. I don't want to live in that world. And I don't think that most of us do. Right. And that's the end game. But the, the, the you know, we don't have the same people who are in control going in the opposite direction, in the libertarian direction where every, any, anyone can say anything. I mean, if they're going to err, they're erring on that particular side rather than on the uh, opposite side, okay? So why is that? I think it's because um, they have been indoctrinated into believing that there's a higher good, okay, and that, um, you know, we got to be nice to everybody and uh, – we can't hurt anybody's feelings, and if we do, or we ser if we hurt feelings of the people that we like, or we feel are downtrodden and shouldn't have their feelings hurt, then you can open up all manner of uh, you know draconian methods because you're saving the world 
from this nasty stuff. I think that it starts out with that. That mindset seems to totally pervade. Uh, well, not totally. You, once in a while, you hear about somebody working at Facebook or Google who disagrees with that, and they get promptly thrown out. Um, yeah, so that's, I, the thing. You I don't think that's the first long. part. That's the, if you open up your mouth. You know, that's the first part. That that that. You know, the, the these kids who have gotten incredible financial power. Uh, and yet are moral, uh, intellectual, and ethical midgets, okay? They don't have the morality or the ethics to wield that kind of power. And I think we see it every day. And they think that they're somehow empowered because of all of this money. Since money is power to them, there's nothing spiritual about them whatsoever. Since money is power to them, they have no problem using it. They feel it's their duty to use it because they're going to correct the world when they, they don't even know how to correct themselves. Well, this is the problem with uh, with what our society has become is that uh, literally money actually is power. There's no these people have been raised from childhood to think that okay, well, success ba is based on how much money you have. It has nothing to do with finding meaning in your life or leaving the world a better place than you found it, or any anything else that might have in a previous era counted as like morals or ethics or anything like that. It's just a uh, pure uh, free market, the, the the deification of the free market is it's what it's all about and so yeah if you can come up with the killer app the facebook killer app um then you are now all of a sudden uh, a demigod and you can just do whatever you like because you have all the money and you have then like you said all the power and th there's no nothing to it more than that i mean i'm, I'm not uh, saying that oh we need we need a return to the era of religion or whatever, because I don't think that that's a solution. I think, in fact, that many people use uh, religion for another form of control. But I guess, yes, for lack of a better word, spirituality, I, I would say that, that uh, just, you know, a, a sense of something uh, larger and more important than yourself, a sense of something larger and more important than your bank account. Like, if that's the, the focus of your life, then no wonder these people feel the need to make everybody miserable. They must be miserable. I can't imagine going home and then the, the you, what you sit in a dark room like uh, fetishizing the number in your bank account like what what do these people do all day i really i i, I wonder about that i mean do they just play with toys like uh, very expensive toys I, I can't imagine being mark zuckerberg the idea is so horrifying to me it's it's got to be like a really scary person to be <laughs> well that that assumes that you know it is actually mark zuckerberg responsible for all this stuff and i have my serious doubts about that no, you're right. i think he's a front person we'll talk about that next but but um you know having that kind of money and uh believing that you are entitled to that kind of power as the result uh confronts you with that age-old problem of the pen being mightier than the sword okay and the, so we want to take care of that by breaking everybody's pens and deplatforming them until they trade their pens in for uh, finger paint, you know, and just uh, as long as they make nice rainbow pictures about the world, that's fine. But if they start to criticize things and, uh, that, that, and show these fetishizations that these people have made uh, to which you allude, that's off limits. That's verboten. And you get this self-censorship and all the rest of it. And they think they're entitled to do that. Uh, I think that's the first part of the problem is that how do we get ourselves in a situation where we have this entitled group of people? And this is young people. You know, you, we, you mentioned religion. Yeah, religion corrupted by uh, oligarchy, <laughs> you know, because it was a control structure. Sure, so they go ahead and corrupt that. And uh, therefore, yes, religion can be a problem. But here we have a situation where the, these, the minds of these young people have been corrupted, and they're, they're the globalist, the, the new generation of the globalist oligarchs themselves. Well, it's a lot easier to, if you have the people from birth, you have them from childhood, it's a lot easier to social engineer if you get the kids at age three or whatever age they're putting people in a preschool or daycare than if you try to take like an adult at uh, Harvard or University of Chicago or wherever they, they go to mold their future leaders. It's much easier to have to do it if you have them from birth. And a lot of these people, you'll find like Mark Zuckerberg uh, went to the same like summer camps and uh, prep schools as, as a lot of these other like young tech uh, oligarchs or tech billionaires or whatnot. A lot of these people went to the same places. And it's like, you know, at some point you have to figure, OK, well, they had a, a, some sort of way of programming these people to make them especially repulsive and especially power mad. 
because this is more than the usual American uh, repulsive power madness that uh, most people seem to be afflicted with once they get a certain amount of money. This is a special kind of sociopathy that is just, I mean, you really have to have every last bit of humanity drummed out of you. But yes, it obviously, if it wasn't Zuckerberg, it would be somebody else. Um, it's very convenient that like the, the, the year that uh, the Pentagon dropped its life log project, the Facebook comes along giving you the exact same thing as the life log project, which was basically to uh, track every event in a person's life, like every interaction, every like movie date, every uh, place they went, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously people w recoiled from that, which is, well, why wouldn't you? The idea of the government tracking all of that stuff is terrifying. So yeah, let's have a private company doing that instead, which gets to what we were going to talk about otherwise. And that's basically- Which is coming up, but we only have about 10 seconds left okay. in this segment. We'll so- After the commercial break. That's correct. We're going to take a break. <laughs> Helen Beniski, uh, we've got a good, uh, another 45 minutes with her left to go and it'll be great. We'll be all right, good friends. Welcome back. Tom Kiley here, INN World Report Radio with Helen Beniski. We're talking now about um, this outrageous uh, situation with the Internet, social media, Google, uh, algorithms, YouTube, and uh, this incredible censorship that's going on. And before I move to part two, Helen, about what I wanted to talk about in this regard, I just wanted to finish up with these, these uh, inhuman almost, uh, cyborg people that run these things where their power, their financial clout and power is well, well beyond their ethical uh, st uh, capabilities. And, and, and they don't have a problem with that. I mean, there's this new religion now, gross materialism. This fits right in with it. So that's it. You know, the he who dies with the most toys wins. Um, and they're, I, I believe they're front people. But uh, all right. So great. And, and you mentioned that a lot of them, and I think this is true of people like Macron in France as well. They've been groomed, it looks like, to be put into these positions. You know, Macron uh, being marrying his handler from when he was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, let's go to the other part of this, which is, and, and this is something I have to call Rush Limbaugh. I spoke with him uh, 31 years ago. And uh, and he was quite nice on the phone to me on his show live. He gave me a lot of time and we talked very well. And I'm going to call him back because I just heard him the other day, you know, complaining about now the conservatives are complaining that they're coming after them, too, with the social media deplatforming. And what I didn't hear him talk about and what needs to be said is this is the privatization of stuff that the government's not allowed to do yet in a heartbeat. Google or Facebook or anybody will just turn over to the government anything they ask for, right? Yeah. And the and the NSA has all of it anyway, right? Yeah, this is this is all because they they know that they, the First Amendment uh, people actually at least still pay lip service to caring about it, and so if they want somebody to do something that's blatantly unconstitutional, they have their pet companies. I mean, the Facebook funded by Incutel, I think Google. Also, if not, Incutel was funded by some other uh, venture capital firm with one of these alphabet agencies. And these these things have been allowed to get so large and to become such monopolies without any sort of legal confrontation because they want that uh, company on a leash in order to say, OK, well, we need to deplatform this person. We need to silence this person. We need to go after this person. Can't do that with the government because it's censorship. So, uh, yeah, let them rip. Uh, Google, get, get rid of them. Google, delist them. Well, I mean – but but you know when when Facebook started out, they get fifteen million in cash from Incutel, which is there to get the government into uh, tech upstarts. Uh, you know at, at a low level, early entry. Why isn't anybody talking about that besides our group of people? Uh, I, Rush Limbaugh needs to be talking about that. I said, no, 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 Mr. Limbaugh. Yeah, right. Maybe private companies have the right to trash the First Amendment, but. This isn't just a private company here. This is a company that was established in, in no small measure by the security services of the United States. Yeah, these, these are companies that have been basically allowed – I mean the, the term that, that, that I would use is public-private partnership, but that kind of refers to something else. However, it really is like a lot of government backing went into these things and then they – whatever, they sheeped up the funding so that it doesn't look like it comes from the government. They have it passed through all of these uh, other – routes. But um, 
it, the problem with people like Rush Limbaugh is that he's a little late to the party with regards to this. They, these people weren't standing up for the original people being deplatformed. They thought, oh, yeah, those those weirdos, oh, good, less competition or something. Now that it's them, now that the wolves are at their door, they are realizing, oh, whoops, we, maybe we should have been uh, we should have been onto this a little earlier. But I mean, and it's the same thing that, that they're doing with the Second Amendment, of all things, like uh, the payment processors, MasterCard and whatnot, going after some uh, gun manufacturer trying to take away its ability to process funds. Well, it's not the it's not the government taking away your ability to process funds, but it's the, the one of the credit card companies, I think these are MasterCard or maybe both. I think I think it was MasterCard. But um yeah, if it's uh, the, one of the major uh, financial services firms that is now saying we're not going to uh, let you have money anymore, and it's the same thing you got Chase Bank taking away people's bank accounts for uh, people who uh, whose speech doesn't please their masters. Then uh, yeah, you got a problem there because uh, there's nothing you can do if if you're not served by these companies. What, what are you going to do? Bank with uh, uh, AliPay? Go to go to China and use one of those payment processors? I mean, yeah, sure, while well, you can, but uh, who knows how long that's going to last? Well, I I think in that we talk about the uh, the digitization of money too, but but uh, no, I disagree. I I think that uh, you you overestimate the Rush Limbaugh's of the world. I don't, I, you know, you and I are in it deeply with the alternative media i don't think that was on their radar you know when when people like um you know when people started to get deplatformed i mean uh you know i don't i really don't think that they really knew much about that much less cared about it that's what i said that i said that they, they they're late to the party on this they aren't really aware of how much how yeah but you also said is. that's and that's not what i was reacting to i was reacting to you saying now that it's them as if they didn't, as if they knew and didn't care before it was them. I, I don't think they did. Oh, they, I, they weren't paying attention. Right, and I don't think they need to. I think they operate in the, in the more in the more official, official sphere, sphere of uh, the media. Um, are you still there, Helen? Yeah, I'm still there. Uh, okay, I'm messing, I... messing with my. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I heard my own voice in my headphones uh, in, in yeah, a strange way. But anyway, the volume all the way up. Yeah, I I, uh, I get the sense that um, you know Rush Limbaugh still is on the edge of official media, okay. Whereas most of the people we're talking about are on the other side of that divide. But, but Rush Limbaugh is completely domesticated. He's not uh, he's not a threat to the power structure. He just uh, is hearing from people who are because some of them perhaps listen to him. Although I can't really understand why, but uh, that's just my. He's a threat. He's a threat for sure. To the arm of the oligarchy that uses uh, ultra left, uh, you know, not not necessarily a threat to those who use ultra right, but he's certainly a threat to the branch of the oligarchy and their program of ultra left excess. Well, yeah, he might call out like transgender three year olds or something, but um, that's that's low hanging fruit for sure. Uh, I don't know. MSNBC celebrates it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah MSNBC is uh, and, and they're, NBC they're... and all the rest. They Time Magazine. They all celebrate it. You know. Yeah, but they're not. Uh, they're not rubbing it in people's face. It's it's uh, it's a question of like one tiny little slice of very very large and scary uh, program that uh, these people focus on to the detriment of their credibility if they don't touch anything else. If that's the only thing on which they're willing to challenge the ruling program, then I don't trust them and I don't think other people should either. Well, I think that uh, uh, I'm sorry to say the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, the uh, Tucker Carlson's of the world, the Sean Hannity's of the world. Have I, wouldn't lump Tucker, I wouldn't lump Tucker in with those other two. He's actually shown himself to be a person of some integrity, um, at least with regard to like I don't know, challenging the, the war machine and challenging uh, challenging more than just the transgender three year old. Well, you should have heard Rush Limbaugh today. I tell you, it was pretty amazing um, talking about how Americans are fed up with these endless wars in the Middle East and that uh, Donald Trump was not sounding like a warmonger as he's being portrayed by the ultra left media anyway. Wow. So, so, so Rush is not on board the bomb Iran train because absolutely he not was back in the day. Well, he's that. That's why you have to go back once in a while and <laughs> and put your finger back on the pulse again because it yes. tends to change. Okay, that's, that's amazing, and, actually, because he was a he was a big warmonger guy back in the Bush years. He turned into a supporter of Trump, and um, he's supporting Trump on you know Trump not going into Syria, Trump not going into uh, you know into Korea, Trump not going in maybe into Iran. 
uh, it, it, things change. And, you know, I, I never thought I would get good information from Sean Hannity. And he is he's really bad on Israel. But uh, on this Russia collusion um, coup d'etat going on, he's the, he's one of the best, one of the best. Anyway, we'll be right back. We got a break here and then Helen Beniski will be back with us for another 30 minutes. All right, good friends. Welcome back. Uh, Helen Beniski and I have been talking about a few different things, the, the Iranian situation, the censorship. And I think we've really talked about that a lot. Helen, we got a couple more segments left in tonight's show. What else is on your radar that you are concerned about? And uh, let's see if it crosses with anything I got on mine. And we could talk about that and maybe fit one more topic in after that. Well, this, uh, the, the, these, uh, these biometric uh, database things, like the, this new big, huge one that they're coming up with, this, this is just more a, a thing that I mentioned in passing. But uh, the fact that the entire U.S. government is now basically concentrated on Amazon servers, I mean, <laughs> it's like, what, what exactly are we moving towards here? Like, it, I, what, what I would really, what would be a great plot for a film, I guess, because it will never happen in reality, is if uh, it turned out that Jeff Be- Bezos this entire time was this was all a plot and he was working to get all the government assets under his control and then he unveils and then whoops he's working for I don't know some other government China or something and oh wow they just shut me off they just shut me right off in the middle of that I was going to say China or Israel and then <laughs> huh. they just shut my uh, yeah so that's really funny maybe, maybe I'm onto something with we can guy. hear you I don't know what what got shut off no, because... my, 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 my thing got muted um, ah, they've right. been doing it the whole show it's really well it a... came across we heard everything you okay. said yeah. cool well, that's, all right. that's good <laughs> maybe it's just your headphones all right look I think you're looking at it the wrong way around I would suggest instead you look at it like the real power that is that owns the government and everything else is is starting to dispense with formalities and uh, doesn't feel the need to be hiding behind a fig leaf of government anymore and is coming right out. Uh, it's a form of neo-feudalism. You know, they've got their their dukes and their uh, captains in charge of this area or that province or whatnot. And, uh, and that's who these people are. There's certainly the Bezos with all his money is is a piker. He's a Johnny come lately. He's not somebody who's been around for a long time, not the top most level of the oligarchy, but he's a useful front man. I always say if you know who they are and you see who they are, then they're not very high up. You know what I mean? Oh, and uh, actually, I, I would agree on the, the whole privatization thing, because right. this is what you see in, in any empire that's uh, gradually running out of money is just uh, the selling off of the assets. Um, I mean, everything is getting outsourced. I mean, everything is is privatized. So you've got what, one thing that I saw today, looking for stories for um, for RT, was that they're the state of Alabama is authorizing uh, the churches and schools and everything to operate their own police forces now because they can't afford to pay for their police forces. And so you're going to see more and more of this. So what does that tell you? What does that tell you? This, what, uh, this, what is the number one takeaway? I mean, I would from, say that this is the well, entire- uh, Hold on, hold on. What is the number one takeaway from the notion that governments are no longer paying for police forces? That they don't need them? Who doesn't need them? The government doesn't need them because we're policing ourselves. There's no uh, crime anymore. <laughs> no, that's actually no, wrong. No, no, no. There actually I, is crime. I, I but, submit um... to, yeah, I submit to you that police forces were created to protect oligarchy. OK, and their stuff, because back in the day uh, they lived in the city state right next to the rabble. All right. There's a famous situation. I don't know if you've ever been to. Uh, have you ever been to Florence? Um, yes. Very Firenze. Busy. All right. So have you ever visited the Medici uh, Palace in the heart of Florence? No, I was only there for a couple hours, so I didn't get a chance. By the way, you know, the very powerful Medici family, they got their start uh, as uh, with an apothecary. Did you know that they uh, started in medicine? I did not. And some believe that the term medicine comes from Medici. So Medici. Okay. And in any case, they had this they've got this really big, fancy stone block house in the middle of Florence. uh, And they even engineered like a, a gallery, an enclosed elevated gallery that they could walk across the Ponte Vecchio to the um, 
to the to the Florentine, uh, you know, city council or whatever, so they could walk without anybody interfering with them. But uh, and I think I've sent pic- <clears throat> this might be before you were in our salon. I've even sent pictures out the house of the Medici out on the street, and this is like it's like a it's like a, an old fashioned keep. You know, you can't get in there. It's like a fortress, right? But it's on the city streets, and that there's a a marble bench that goes all the way around the house that you can sit on. And according to the Italian tour guides, it's because the Medici wanted the regular people to feel like they were giving something back. They could take a rest. They could take a nap. You know, don't don't come after us with the pitchforks and the torches. And I submit to you that police forces first started to protect people like the Medici and the oligarchy from people wanting to steal their stuff, especially when they live together in cities. So if police forces are being phased out by governments, it's a clear signal to me that oligarchy feels they don't need them anymore. Okay, that they have their own privatized. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. You just, just no. Says so that government. Need government doesn't need it anymore. I said. Oh, you oligar- said all oligarchy. Oligarchy, okay. oligarchy doesn't need it anymore. They have enough control now. They feel with all these other silent, well, yeah, more this, preferable this means. Back, this gets back to the the, the police within the police. The police. The best police state has inculcated the sense of, uh, I guess, learned helplessness, but uh, the, this that people will just behave themselves out of uh, instinctive or even better yet, just the uh, the lack of knowledge that there's any other option than behaving oneself. I mean, I phrased it that uh, the, 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 the idea that uh, in 1984 the party wants you to say two plus two equals five, the best, the, the, the their ideal world is such that you would never think that two plus two equals anything other than five. Because, of course, why would it ever possibly equal anything but five? And uh, so in this case, the, the police state, the best the best one, the, the ideal police state is such that nobody would ever think to step out of line because they wouldn't realize it was possible. And that's why people are conditioned from birth to uh, – not, not necessarily from birth, but from the, their, the first time they step into a daycare or a preschool or whatever, um, assuming their parents aren't part of this uh, behavioral inculcation system – but um, yeah, just just to you know, do what you're told. Raise your hand, sit down, shut up, and uh, accept what you are given in life. Because you better not that, demand anything. I I agree. That's not enough, though. There's always that little outlying fringe that you have to keep your eye on. Number one, number two. As far as that goes, you said it before. I'm gonna about you know inculcating from a young age. By the way. That's because they're away from the parents. Okay, that the parents aren't doing the inculcation anymore. Okay. Yeah. That, and that was a device to peel the family apart so that this could happen, by the way. Plus, you're getting tax now, taxes from women as well as men. You know, um, But in any case, we're going to come up on a break uh, pretty soon. But I'll, you know, I'd like to say that um, you know, that's part of it. You, but you can't guarantee that the entire s- society is going to self-censor that way. And what you have now is the – insane fetishized reliance on information to the point where you need to know every single thing somebody's done. And that leads to insanity because, uh, and I think uh, Tolkien uh, put it nicely in the Lord of the Rings with that invisible ring. You know, nobody can see you gathering information on them. You know everything about them, but all that information ends up turning you into an insane person. And uh, I think that's what we're Having, in fact, matter of fact, I'm going to write an article about it called "Alas, Babel." <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it's just that there's no uh, there's no quality control because you can have everything, so there's no need to pick and choose what what's most important. Uh, there's All right, no, hold, there's... it's important that we take a break. We'll be right back with Helen. Just All right, good friends, welcome back. Uh, coming down the home stretch with Helen Beniski uh, one more time. Helen of Destroy. dot com. What a great. Uh, that's such a moniker you got there, nom de guerre, nom de plume, whatever you want to call it. Um, you, you obviously got a, a an influence of, somehow by Homer in that name. Was was Homer a, a force on you, or did uh, how did you come I up with say, that? I, I mean, I grew up reading Greek myths and whatnot, and I always thought that the, you can tell a lot about uh, society by the quality of their like founding mythology or just their their storytelling and whatnot. And um, I mean, obviously the Greeks had some great ones. And since my name is Helen, obviously I'm not really reaching too far with that. Yeah. I I was talking with my wife about your persona today, a little bit telling her that you were coming on the show tonight. And am I that far off uh, to suggest that you uh, were, uh, you know, you find the, the, what they used to call the goth influence uh, interesting. Oh yeah, I used to be a goth back okay. in the day. All right. 
Sure. So does a, does that sardonic sense of humor that could sometimes accompany that position uh, have anything to do with the Helen of Destroyed? Yeah, that was, I mean, it was, I think the first time I used that name was on the proto social media on live journal of all things. So, but I mean, it's, it's just, it's a fitting name. I think it the destroy the, uh, the ruling power structure. I mean, that obviously that wasn't what I had in mind when I first came up with it. It was just a funny play on words, but it has come to be a pretty good um, sort of pen name, I think. Hello? Yes, I'm sorry about that. I actually grabbed the phone call. I'm, I'm sorry. So I had to turn down. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I just I'm so charmed by the Helena Destroy that I'm trying to, you know, um, go back and figure out how it all came about. But and I figured Homer was in there somehow. But uh, it's just it's very clever. Um, oh, thanks. I like it. All right. So um, we only have a little bit of time left. I, you know, you touched on mythology. May we go out by talking about mythology a little bit? Yes, I mean, there's certainly, yeah, the, the myths of this culture, um, I mean, it's really a shame what, what it's become, because like our founding myths, this whole, oh, well, don't tell us what to do, we're going to go out and start our own country, and you can't, uh, you can't uh, make us fit into your, you can't make, uh, you can't extract taxation money from us, and we're just going to be all independent. It's really sad what we've become, because our founding myths are pretty damn good, I think. Uh, all right. How far back are you going when you say our founding myths? I'm talking about American. I'm talking about 1776. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, revolution. I mean, they, they leave out some important stuff like, you know, slavery. They leave out the bad stuff, but, uh, the good stuff, the, uh, the founding myths, the, uh, the, the PBS, uh, special or Hallmark special version. I mean, it's pretty, pretty good, pretty good for if for. Well, a, you know what? I, I see a lot. I see a lot of discussion how they struggled with slavery in the beginning, and that it was clearly uh, a, a problem to be reckoned with the ideals that they were putting forth, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the, this is the, the the way that they they did kind of sweep it under the rug with the whole. Okay, so we're gonna count slaves as three fifths of a person. Ooh, yeah. But, but, but I uh, I think they also. No, I understand it was it was a product of its time, obviously. Yeah, but, well, not but, only that, but they inherited that situation. I mean, th this was not a breakaway from England from day one. It was very much English. Uh, yeah, they, they, with they, all they, that. They brought it. They imported it with the rest of English society for sure. There wasn't right, and then it got to a point where they broke away from England, and they had to deal with what it what, what it was like at the time. And uh, you know, I think they've come. We've come a long way since then. Uh, uh, come full circle. We were starting off with myth. Now we're right back into slavery. Reparations a big discussion oh, going on right now, right? Yeah. Now how how crazy yeah. is that? I mean, you know, well, nobody. Yeah, it's it's a little insane because I mean a lot of the people, a lot of the white people who whose ancestors came over after slavery was dead and gone, are now going to be what did we, we're, we're assumed to be guilty because uh, my my great grandparents came over in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century from Poland, and uh, they certainly had nothing to do with this whole uh, slavery thing. So I mean, who's... my my ancestry comes from Ireland and uh, Sicily, you know. Uh, a little more than a hundred years ago. I mean, well after slavery, and it's like, excuse me, they were uh, the Irish, especially, were you know escaping their own uh, form of slavery with the British. I mean, you know, uh, hey, yeah, it's it's a very strange situation because it's clearly designed. I think that the focus on reparations right now is designed as part of this eternal divide and conquer thing that uh, just keep the races at each other's throat so that. To, we don't. Nobody looks upstairs and says, "Oh, well, you know, we we all have the same 001 percent oligarchy oppressing us, and then get their boot off our throat, and then we can work out our differences because our differences are not actually that different." I mean, I've been saying constantly that it's not like a racism thing; it's a an economic form of discrimination. It's uh, if you're not uh, on the top rung, then you're on the bottom, and you're being stomped on. But Unfortunately, there's no uh, media mouthpiece for that. You're just uh, you get lost in the shuffle. Well, not only that, but again, um, you know, I, I go back to Alan Watt. I think he's brilliant. Uh, and I haven't just heard this from him as well, but um, that uh, the globalists, the top dog oligarchs, you know, engineer these financial collapses from time to time to put the Donald Trumps back in their place. In other words, anybody who manages to get through the system in a 
accumulates a threatening amount of wealth will be ground to the, the term I've actually heard used to describe this is that they'll be ground to dust during these economic depressions that come by periodically, also known as the business cycle, you know, and, and that it's a way of just whacking the weeds on the lawn, you know what I mean? To keep um, any threat to their economic power from coming up. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's a lot, very easy to get rid of the inconvenient to people. You just come along and sweep them all away with an economic crash. I mean, everybody gets foreclosed on. Everybody's scrambling to. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you'll never see a yellow vest movement in the U.S. is because everybody is just trying so hard to hold it together economically that uh, they don't have time to protest. Everybody's working two or three jobs. Um, it's not really. I mean, it's it's very difficult to have people get out in the streets. The best they can do is is make a YouTube video or post an article, and then that stuff gets lost in the shuffle. Uh, or if it isn't deplatformed, um, the more effective it is, the more likely it would be deplatformed. Um, yeah, but we had that. We had a shot at that with the stupid uh, Occupy Wall Street baloney. I mean, oh my god! I, I'm assuming you went down there to to, to watch the fracas. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was like I like the idea. I don't think that the I think that unfortunately the execution it was used as an experimental testing ground for all this social justice warrior nonsense that has now become de rigueur in the left um, as far as like, oh, well, we, we can't oppress any uh, two-person minority that might happen to be lurking in this crowd, so we have to use these little like finger-wavy things. If anybody disagrees, then we got to start all over again. We can't have any demands because, you know, demanding things is aggressive, and I mean— <laughs> And we're all equal, so uh, you had that. Uh, yeah, we're all equal, including. We're all equal, so even somebody who knows what they're talking about doesn't get the microphone because some idiot that doesn't know what they're talking about has to have it. You know? Yeah, no, it was definitely used as a testing ground for all the worst of like the the what has become the the uh, the dysfunctional left. That stuff was all tested out during Occupy because I mean they knew they realized that after after the bailout, people were going to be a little uh, upset, and so they had to pacify that pretty quickly. Well, if you looked at the uh, New York Police Department uh, instant uh, gun towers that they had up there with all the bristling with antenna. Oh, I think yeah. Was... yeah. They, had, they had snipers ready to, to. Right. But it was also it was also quite a testing ground for, you know, how to how to sweep up all the electronic communications in, in an yeah, area that... too. No question about that. I mean, you know, I think I used to, I think I might have taken the battery out of my phone every time I <laughs> went down there or something like that, the, uh, which. You can't even do anymore with some of the phones. No, so, you can't. Not with an iPhone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ugh. Oh, you know, speaking of which, um, I'm on my, we've got about two minutes left. But uh, Google, I've been forced into a business situation where a partner of mine started the company using Gmail, which is the most ridiculous thing in the world. I never use Gmail. Any free uh, email is not free. They're hoovering up all your information. And then your customers are using it too, so they're getting both sides of it to uh, hoover up all this information about you and your business so that they could sell the information to competing businesses anyways uh i had the shock of my life i had to put this gmail on my on one of my phones so that i could keep track of emails while i was at, not in the office and i had taken some photos with that phone and then uh as i am wont to do from time to time i plugged the phone into my pc to download the photos and uh it turns out that um, I got a, 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 an email from Gmail showing me my photos on my phone. Oh, that's thoughtful of them. And they asked me, uh, hey, look at all the great things we can do with your photos. I didn't give them permission to do that. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. shocked. That's... I had an email from Google with my pictures on it off my phone. That's really creepy. Wow. Super creepy. And yeah. they said, look what we could do. And they, they, they took the color out of one and look at the cool things we could do with your picture. Isn't that scary? That's pretty creepy. Yeah. I mean, and Facebook got in trouble for something similar when um, they like a, a, a couple of million users, I think, had their images that they hadn't posted to Facebook, images that, that were private. Those images were hacked and leaked. And then, whoops, all of a sudden. The, the pictures on your phone that you thought were your private pictures, not anymore. Which is and, just, and, and and these young people just don't care about it. You know, oh, I don't know. Not, I this thing is privacy. That's I ain't a terrorist, so I don't care. You know, yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, Helen, um, thank you very much. I look forward to your coming down here to the New Jersey Shore again this summer, and uh, we'll hang out and we'll solve the world's problems yet once again. Indeed. I've certainly got enough of them. 
Well, thank you. Helen of Destroy.com, and she also writes at RT. Thanks a lot, Helen. See you next time. See you next time. Have a good night.